Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very good day to you. This is Channel 347 ITV Networks. Welcome to Health Matters COVID-19 Extra. I'm Khawa Solomon. Please stay with me for the next hour or so. Do not go anywhere. Don't touch that dial. As we update you on new facts on COVID-19. Please do stay tuned. We've got a very important interview with Professor Mahdi, Professor of Vaccinology at Fits, some interesting facts, more information, but to help us, you know, sort of uh, encounter all this information and embrace it and not let it be a load for us, we will also be chatting to clinical psychologist Grant Meyer Strong a little bit later on. Please do interact with us as we want your comments, questions and queries via our WhatsApp line. The show is about you, what you think, what you want to hear and what you also want to see. What's important to you? Do to you during this lockdown. So first, the government is telling us all it's, it's lockdown, so no religious or social gatherings can be allowed. Don't put your life and the lives of others at risk. That's a message from government. Note also we've got our slogan from the IMA executive member, Wahida uh, Esop. Take a listen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Wahida Esop. National Executive Member of the Islamic Medical Association. Days to remember. My kids, the apple of my eye. We give our time, heart and soul. We nurture. We advise. We mold. We love. Do we look at them with pride and adoration? A big shukran to Wahida, a sub occupational therapist, as well, providing us for uh, providing us with her hashtag slogans for today. Please do follow her page, Wahida OT. So, did you know that today would have been uh, your Freedom Day, as in t the f 21 days of lockdown being over? Yes, it is the 22nd day of lockdown, which means yesterday would have been the last day of lockdown. But as we know, it's been extended till the end of the month, another two weeks, and for good reason. So, tell us how your 21 days have been thus far. Can, can you believe it? You have been in lockdown for 21 days. So, has it gone really quickly? Has it dragged along? We want your interaction and also to find out what's happening in your household with regards to you know being in isolation and in lockdown so note our interview a little bit later on professor Mahdi interact with us via our whatsapp line so now we link up with our clinical psychologist and that is grant Maya strong to help us through and also understand all of these facts figures um, of COVID-19 assalamualaikum to you my head shukran so much for joining us Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, it's nice to be with you. So we appreciate your uh, gracious time that you've afforded, uh, afforded us. Please do just help us understand how do we cope with all the COVID-19 information that's available literally on every radio station and every channel, but also in the in the way where we can stay informed as well. In this way, you know, we're living in uh, unprecedented times at the moment. I think the last pandemic, um, you know, virus that, that gripped the, the globe in such a big way was nearly 100 years ago, and it was a very dif a different time back then. Um, obviously, the times that we're living in today with social media, with the internet, with hundreds if not thousands of news channels, um, make it a very, very uh, interesting but also a challenging time for us to, um, um, that, we, that we're living through at the moment. You're asking specifically about coping. I think when it comes to coping, there's a very long and big discussion that we can have about it, but I think maybe as a point of departure, the, the most important thing for us to, to state right at the beginning is that people cope very differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us to be able to understand what we do with all this information and, and facts that are out there, I think we have to ask ourselves, how do, how do I cope? And to break down years and years of research in a very brief and concise manner, there's three predominant ways in which human beings, based on studies of neuroscience, um, grapple with, with coping and specifically with information. And if I could just highlight that briefly for you, sure. you know, we either overcompensate by wanting to know all the facts and to break them down into details and work with them, or we avoid it completely or we surrender to whatever it is that we hear. Mm -hmm. So it can be very, very difficult based on 
you know, your unique coping style as an individual. So I think what you're trying to say, depending on the individual and how, what their temperament is, is how they handle it. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. this, this, this does sometimes affect people's concentration, the, the, the sleeping patterns. Um, grabbing all of that, is it something that we should be doing, all that information, um, or, or should we just be taking it day by day or literally week by week? You know, it's, it's definitely um, a good idea to try and structure um, the information that we're getting. I think what, when, you know, South Africa went into even its pre-lockdown phase, what the government tried to do was to centralize all information and to make sure that whatever is being put out there is credible. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to try and understand, for me to stay informed and to be abreast of whatever is happening out there, how much information do I need? What will I do with it? Do I know only the fact? Uh, what will make me feel safe and calm? Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a, there's a sort of a green zone, if you like, that keeps us adaptable. So mm -hmm. if you're a person that overcompensates and wants all the stats and watch all the news channels from, from you know, morning to evening, what purpose does it serve for you? Is it, does it remain adaptable? Can you actually make decisions? Will it affect your life in such a way that you can go and do something differently? If the answer is no, then you're probably doing too much and you need to consider disconnecting a little bit. Similarly, if, you, if, you, if your coping style is aligned with avoiding whatever is out there, you know, your anxiety uh, and sometimes depression can be fueled by not knowing enough. Mm. So maybe then I should consider just getting involved to an extent, you know, consuming news from the credible channels, just so that I understand we are in a period of lockdown, mm. Uh, maybe the minimal uh, amount of information will do uh, for me, but at least I know that I'm consuming the news and the facts in a responsible way so that I can keep myself and my loved ones safe, as safe as possible. Okay, talking about loved ones, we are in lockdown with our children. How do we limit the information to them? What is, what is important for them to know in the sort of age-appropriate manner as well? Oh, I think you've, you've, you've touched on, very, on a very important point because we have a very you know, important duty to try and help our little ones self-regulate because you know, the, de the development of their brains are such that they're just not able to do it for themselves right now. So I would definitely ask people to become mindful, you know, especially if you're feeling a bit anxious and you're feeling a bit frantic about all the information out there, you know, try and be careful about what you discuss in front of your children, you know, in a manner for, for them to, to, to hear uh, and, and, and become dysregulated. I think speaking about how do you, you know, keep your children involved in the conversation, because I think that is also important. So understand that, you know, children respond to storytelling, you know, in a very age appropriate, and especially if, we talk, if, we speak, if you're talking about it is under the age of 10. A good way to engage them is to break down all of these facts that we've now understood, that we've now accepted as credible, and, and to break it down in a, in, a, in a kind of a storytelling way um, to let them know what's happening uh, out there. I think very important would also be um, to not forget that we need to instill hope in them. Yeah. And that we need to you know, uh, help them understand this is something that's happening at the moment. We don't know how long it's going to last for, but it will most likely come to an end, you know, inshallah, very soon. So I mean, help children not only absorb the information, but help them to digest it in a way, again, that helps them to feel safe and calm with everything that's going on out there at the moment. Grant Maher, uh, strong uh, clinical psychologist. Jazakallah for your time. We have to leave it there. And uh, shukran Thanks. for doing the great work that you are doing. And do keep it up. We appreciate the essential services that you do provide. Assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum salam. There we have it, some pertinent uh, mental information before we do delve into the facts and figures just after this. Welcome back. We now chat to Professor Shabir Mahdi uh, to update us on the situation with COVID-19 and what South Africa needs to know and us as viewers. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back, uh, Prof. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for having me back. So let's look at the situation that we know. We are in lockdown and we understand this is going to go right up until the end of April, inshallah. Um, could you tell us what the purpose was for the extension of this lockdown? 
Okay, so I think it's important just to perhaps take a step back and understand what are the main reasons for a lockdown. So the first reason for a lockdown is what we're trying to do is limit community transmission or the rate of community transmission. So obviously if people that are infected are just staying in their own house and not uh, circulating in the community and there aren't other people in the community, others are not going to get infected in the community, but people within that particular house might get infected from that infected individual. So that's the first reason for the lockdown, to limit uh, community, the rate of community transmission. Now, the second reason for the lockdown is that if we expect a sudden massive uh, increase, a sudden surge in terms of number of severe cases, uh, what it could do is that it could overwhelm our hospital services. So what we're trying to do is sort of contain the spread of the virus in the community uh, and that if there is hospitalizations that take place in the future, it's spread out over a much longer period of time, which will, which will assist the healthcare facilities to cope with additional demands because of individuals who might develop severe illness from uh, the SARS coronavirus 2, which is called COVID-19. Now, the third reason for a lockdown, and probably the most important reason, which isn't emphasized enough, mm. is that the lockdown basically provides us an opportunity to actually go looking in the communities for people that might be infectious without them in the meantime infecting other people in the community, mm. to find those people in the different houses, to confirm that they are infectious, that they're getting the virus, to put those individuals into isolation, and to put other members of that household that are not symptomatic and that are not infected, as far as we can tell, into quarantine. So that is the third reason, and probably the most important reason, is that it allows us an opportunity to maximize our ability to identify infectious cases in different households, whilst at the same time limiting the possibility of those individuals to actually uh, infecting others. So what is the reason for extending the lockdown? Well, the first thing is that uh, we're still trying to buy some time in terms of making sure that our healthcare facilities are adequately prepared for an increase in number of cases that are going to occur. And that is not, that is uh, pretty much certain that we are going to get an increase in terms of number of cases that are going to occur once the lockdown is lifted. But the difference is, rather than this having happened at this point in time, we are allowing it or we're pushing it further down the line for it to perhaps start occurring around about July, August. By which time we're hoping that our healthcare facilities would have had ample time to at least increase their capacity to deal with more admissions to the hospital. And that is one of the main reasons why the lockdown has been extended. But the other important reason why the lockdown has been extended is that unfortunately what we didn't do in the first two weeks of the lockdown is the third point that I alluded to. And that is we didn't have an aggressive strategy to go out looking for the people that were symptomatic in households, to test them, to put them into isolation, and to put their contacts into quarantine. So now what we're doing is that for a, and as you heard the president announced last week, the plan now is to mobilize a workforce of up to about 10 to 24,000 people that will be going to each house or to many households to screen for people that are symptomatic. And if those people are found to be symptomatic, then they will be tested. If they're infected, they will need to go into some form of isolation and the context will need to be quarantined. So what we're trying to achieve now is we're trying to identify the infectious cases. We hadn't done that in the first two weeks of the lockdown. So in first, unfortunately, unfortunately, we hadn't done that in the first two weeks of the lockdown uh, because of a variety of reasons. But now that we've extended it for another two weeks, it provides us this opportunity to do that. So why is it important to do that even now? The reason why it's important is that when the lockdown is lifted, what we want to avoid is people that we know that are infected going immediately into the community and infecting many other people over a very short period of time. So we were wanting to avoid that. And it's important to, to be able to avoid that. It's important to identify the majority. We're not going to be able to identify all, but at least a large majority of the people that are infected at this point in time is what we need to be able to identify in the period of the next two weeks. Okay, so let's look at the, the presentation Professor Kadam did this week um, and stated that the, the first two weeks of the lockdown, there were low numbers. That, does that mean we've contained the virus? Yeah, so unfortunately not. Uh, so I think the reality of the lockdown, especially for the first two weeks, is that rather than increasing the number of tests that were done, 
the number of deaths that were actually being done was de actually decrease. Hmm. But there are also other reasons why the numbers didn't really increase that much uh, after the lockdown was implemented. So you need to remember that the first thing is that at a time when the lockdown was actually implemented, the criteria that we were using or the recommendations for who should be tested was limited to people that were travelers or people that were in contact with travelers or people that were in contact with people that were known to be infected. So we had a very restrictive algorithm in terms of who was being requested to be to come forward for testing. As an example, someone with a fever with a cough with a headache uh, who didn't have a contact with a recent traveler to one of the affected countries, who didn't have a contact issue with an infectious case, that person would not have qualified for testing based on the previous recommendations. Mm. Okay, the second part, so we had, very restrict, we had a very restrictive algorithm in terms of who was to be tested. Uh, so it didn't allow us to quantify the true number of people in the community that weren't travelers or weren't in contact with travelers that might have been infected. So that's the first problem. Uh, the, second, the second reality is that the lockdown did start limiting transmission in the community. But more important than that, it actually reduced the number of travelers coming into the country. So you might recall with the lockdown, we closed our borders to all international flights. So by doing that, what eff effectively happened is that we weren't importing any more cases. Mm. And certainly that you see in the first two weeks of the lockdown, where the day-to-day the -day increase was fairly limited. So it was a combination of two things. The first thing is that we had very restrictive criteria in terms of our testing. Very little testing was done. And the third part of it really was an issue of uh, there no longer being incoming travelers that might have been infected if you're contributing to a large percentage of the cases before the lockdown was implemented. So what is being shown in terms of the number of cases doesn't reflect the reality. Uh, it just tells us that unfortunately we weren't very pedantic in terms of how we should have gone about testing. So there are limitations in terms of how to actually interpret the data. But there most likely was a reduction in terms of the rate of community transmission, but not necessarily in terms of what was uh, actually the true number of cases that existed at that point in time. Let's look at the graphs that uh, uh, Professor Karim presented. And South Africa's was unique to other countries. Why, why was that? Okay, look, so like it's it goes back to the answer I just gave in that South Africa, uh, there isn't anything unique, unique about South Africa. Maybe the one thing which distinguishes us from countries such as uh, Italy, as an example, is that certainly our response in terms of the lockdown occurred at a much earlier stage of the epidemic than what was the case in Italy. But there are other countries, such as South Korea, who are highly successful in terms of mitigating the effects of the, of the virus not even by doing a lockdown, but rather by implementing extensive social distancing and having a very aggressive policy in terms of testing symptomatic individuals with a very low threshold in terms of what's being investigated. Okay, so the only thing unique about South Africa is what we see on the graph in that we don't see the same type of increases that we see in other countries, but that head-to-head -head comparison in terms of those sort of optics is actually very misleading. So even if you look at a graph comparing Italy to Germany as an example, mm. what you would see is that uh, they've got similar number of cases, uh, but the types of people that are contributing to those cases are very different. In Italy, the majority of people that are contributing to those hundred thousands of cases of COVID illness are people that are very sick. Mm. They are people that are being hospitalized. So, so that's the reason they've got a very high mortality rate, up, up to about 10%. 10 in Germany, on the other hand, where you've got similar numbers, almost similar numbers to Italy in terms of confirmed cases, you've got a very low mortality rate of 0.5%. But the reason for that is because in Germany, they're much more aggressive with testing even for mild illness. Mm. So when looking at those sort of data, you need to be careful how you actually interpret it. Because the people that have been tested differ between the countries. The number of people that have been tested are completely different between the countries. So you shouldn't make any sort of inference from any of those graphs without being able to actually adjust for the, for the factors, for the denominators that are actually contributing the, to those sort of numbers. Okay, so, so again, there is nothing unique about South Africa. Uh, unfortunately, we don't actually know what the true burden of disease is in South Africa mm -hmm. in the context of having very limited testing up until now.
Okay, so let's look at um, symptoms and, and what sh should people look out for when they decide if they are going for testing? Because you've mentioned okay, the last so now, time the... Since, uh, since of last week, or since the 2nd of April, in fact, but certainly since last week when we've rolled out community-wide testing, uh, the threshold, the criteria used for testing has been uh, very much loosened up. And so far as any, if an individual has got more than two symptoms, mm. Uh, they should actually come forward for testing and they shouldn't actually even need to wait for someone to come to knock on the door to find out if they've got the symptoms. Mm. And the symptoms we're referring to is if a person has got a fever, a cough, a sore throat, a headache, uh, or chest pain, or is short of breath, right? If they've got two of those symptoms, and in fact we can go beyond that, if they start experiencing a sort of loss of sensation in terms of smell and taste, those are actually very good signs that they might actually be uh, infected with a virus. So if they've got at least two of those symptoms, they need to go forward to the closest facility where testing is being offered to actually get tested. They shouldn't go and see the doctor, right? Because that's not what we want. We don't want people to go and visit healthcare workers who are not equipped to do the testing. We are wanting people to go to facilities where the testing is being made available. And those sort of facilities are now being sort of circulated by the Department of Health in terms of which clinics are available for testing to take place. So people need to be proactive in terms of coming forward to be tested. And the reasons for that is multiple. Firstly, it helps us in terms of uh, quantifying the number of people that are infected in South Africa. Secondly, it's important for that person to know that they're infected so that they, that they risk that they transmit the virus to other people in their household is actually reduced. Because once you're known to be infected, you need to go into some form of isolation, right? So the other members in the household that might not be infected, and some of them might already be infected, even if they're not showing symptoms. Mm. But at least the other members in the household that are not infected, you, come, you want to infect them, infect them in the immediate uh, next 14 days or so. So it's important both for the household members, and especially in households, where there are people that are at high risk of developing severe disease. It's even more important in that context. Let's look at some of the readings that uh, that we are finding, you know, on the World Wide Web, where they're saying that the virus, enter, if it enters through your nose and mouth, it sits in your throat for a while. How true is that? Well, so what we know about this virus is that when the virus enters, it can enter through any of your mucous membranes, uh, even your eyes, your mouth and your nose, as you mentioned. And the reason it enters through there is that in those regions, there's sort of a receptor which the virus requires to actually internalize itself into the body. So wherever you find those receptors, be it the nose, be it the back of the throat, even be it the tongue, the virus is able to attach there and then it remains there. Now, the virus only disappears after the body's immune system is able to mount a response against the virus. So the body's immune system recognizes this as a foreign material. And anything that's foreign to the body, the immune system will start, will get activated to try to get rid of it, and eventually it kills it off. Uh, so that's how we deal with all, all germs, not just uh, the SARS coronavirus. Now, it takes time for that immune system to start organizing itself in all these different manners in which it can get rid of a virus. Okay, and that time period is up to about 10 to 14 days. And that's the reason why we find that many people that have been infected, the virus will remain in the nose, in the throat, uh, on the tongue, for up to about 14 days, and in some even longer. Uh, in some people, it can go up to about three weeks, uh, even up to four weeks. Uh, but the majority of people is roughly about uh, 10 to 14 days that the virus will still be found, uh, and during that period of time, they can still be infectious, which means they can still, still spread the virus. And, okay. and that's the reason when someone tests positive for the virus, what we say is that that person needs to go into isolation for at least 14 days, right? Because that is what we expect the usual time of the virus remaining in the body, being still alive and able to infect other people. So when you start getting symptoms and you actually feel it's in your mouth or in your throat, um, is there anything that you could do? Or is it, the, I know that you're saying the first port of call is to go for testing, but at home they're saying, you know, drink some boiling water with lemon, ginger, whatever. What is your comments around that? Yeah, look, there's nothing that you can do that's going to get rid of the virus sooner than the body's own immune system is going to get rid of the virus. Uh, unfortunately, at this point in time, we don't have any medicine uh, that you can use either. There's a number of experiments in uh, clinical studies that are ongoing 
looking at different sort of things which might reduce the duration of shedding of the virus. But there is absolutely nothing that's been proven to reduce the, shedding, the duration of shedding of the virus or how long the virus continues in a body uh, at this point in time. So those studies are underway. Uh, I mean, drinking, having vitamin C is good, but it's not going to change what happens to the virus in your body. Okay. Uh, because this is something that requires the body's own immune system mm -hmm. to be activated to fight off the virus. And that's the reason, as an example, why people that have got immunosuppressive conditions, people that are very old, their immune system is weak, that's the reason why they end up getting severe disease. Because their body is not able to fight off the virus, mm. the virus continues multiplying, gets into the lung, multiplies in the lung, and then starts causing problems in the lung because the body's immune system tries to attack the virus in the lung, and it damages the lung. Uh, so it's really about the immune system of the individual that will determine how well an individual will perform after they actually infected with the virus. We continue our questions and answers session with Professor Shabir Mahdi, that is the Professor of Vaccinology, Vaccinology in WITS. Just after this, don't forget to interact with us via our, S our WhatsApp line. Back in a moment. Welcome back. This is Channel 347 Health Matters, COVID-19 Extra. I'm Khoa Solomon. Stay with us as we continue our conversation with Professor Mahdi. Okay, let's look at the, the new findings around being a carrier, being completely asymptomatic, not showing any symptoms at all, and actually just carrying the virus. Uh, sorry, just can you repeat so, that? So let's look at the uh, the new findings around individuals just being carriers. So they're completely uh, asymptomatic for all that time and actually just spreading the virus. Do they now okay, need so to go to testing? Some, yeah, so I think this is some really important uh, information that's come forward in the past week, in fact. Uh, so previously, we believed that the majority of people that were infected with the virus uh, developed some symptoms, at least mild symptoms. Uh, but what has been shown in the past week and in two different studies, in fact, three different studies, uh, where they were sort of less selective in terms of who they were testing. Uh, they included anyone uh, that came their way, uh, whether they had symptoms or not, including a study in China, one study in New York in pregnant women that were delivering babies, and in uh, Iceland, uh, where they were basically screening everyone in Iceland because it's a small country to find out who might be infected with the virus. Mm. And in those studies, what they showed is that in all the people in whom they found the virus, between in Iceland it was 70%, in the study in pregnant women it was 80%, and the Chinese study with returning travelers was about 80%. So that is between 70 to 80% of people that they found the virus in didn't have any symptoms. They were completely asymptomatic, right? Which is very important, and it's both good news as well as bad news. Okay. So the good news part of it is that it means that our calculations can now change. Before we said that uh, of all the people that become infected with the virus, maybe 2% will be asymptomatic, 85% will have mild symptoms, and 15% will develop severe disease. Mm. Right? Now what we can say is that of all the people that are infected with the virus, 80% of them actually won't have any signs or symptoms. They won't even know they're sick. They won't even go for testing because there's no reason to test sure. them. But their body will develop some level of immunity against the virus, which is important. That's 80%. Now, of the other 20% that might become sick, like I said, 85% will develop mild symptoms, which means they'll have a cough, runny nose, headache, fever, but that will disappear after a few days. They'll be healthy after that, without any clean. Right? It's the other 15% that will still develop severe disease. But if we put all of these numbers together, Rather than 15% of all people now being in, that are infected developing severe disease, that number now changes to 3% of all people that are infected that will develop severe disease. And so I don't want to get too much into the calculations around this, but it changes the paradigm. What it also changes is our estimates in terms of the number of people that might die because of the virus. So our previous understanding and our previous calculations in terms of the number of people that might die from the virus was based on the majority of people that become infected will have some symptoms, 
and then a percentage of those will die, which is between 1 and 3 percent of the people that get symptoms will actually die from the virus. Now when we say that 80 percent of the infections will be asymptomatic, right, that 1 to 3 percent changes completely. Now it goes down to almost a quarter of that. So what I'm saying is that rather than 1 to 3 percent of people that are infected with a virus will die, that figure now goes down to as, as low as 0 0.25 percent. Okay. of people that are infected with the virus will actually die. Right, so the estimated number of people from two weeks ago, as an example in South Africa, that we thought would die from the virus, mm. is probably three to four times higher than what we now think would actually occur with this new information. Another important part of this is what we call herd immunity. Right, so what herd immunity is, when a certain percentage of the population are infected with the virus, the virus is no longer that efficient in terms of infecting new people mm. that are still susceptible. Because people develop immunity, they, even if they become infected, they're probably not going to develop severe infections from the virus. Now, for this virus, we need to get herd immunity of about 60%, which means about two-thirds of the population needs to be infected to this virus before we have less, before we see uh, lower rates of hospitalization from this virus. Now that we know that so many people are asymptomatic when infected with a virus, it means that the period of time that it's going to take to get to that herd immunity is going to be much shorter than if we just waited for symptomatic infections to occur. And so it's got good news, it's good news in that respect that we're going to get herd immunity much sooner than what we otherwise expected when we thought that a majority of individuals that were being infected were actually symptomatic. So then do we need to look at then the cases that are quite severe and those that are, you know, actually dying and on the brink of dying because of this and how we can help them? Yeah, so look, so the reality is what hasn't changed uh, since the start of the virus is that the groups of people that are identified as being, as being at high risk hmm. still remains fairly the same. And those are people over the age of 65, definitely over the age of 70, people with chronic lung disease, uh, chronic heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, uh, smokers to some extent, uh, etc. So that group of people, when they get infected with a virus, uh, and especially if they're symptomatic, their chances of dying is anything between 10 and 20 percent, or 7 and 20 percent, which is very, very high. Now, the unfortunate news is that information from the United Kingdom uh, recently showed that even in the United Kingdom, where they've got much more resources in South Africa, is that once a person is put onto a ventilator, into ICU on a ventilator, the chances of that person surviving, unfortunately, is very low. It's less than one third of people that require ICU that are put onto a ventilator that, that, that survive. Right? So it tells us that we don't have, so we can make some difference by having more ICUs and more ventilators, which itself is a very resource demanding sort of intervention, but it tells us that we've got limited ability in terms of maneuvering with regard to reducing case fatality risk. Like the case fatality risk calculation, as I said, has decreased in the context of the asymptomatic infections, but we've got limited ability at this point in time in terms of uh, limiting uh, the number of deaths that are going to occur. Uh, what we're trying to do is obviously, like I said, spread out the disease, severe disease over a longer period of time, over a few months, rather than over one or two months, mm. which is part of what the lockdown is trying to achieve. And hopefully by doing that, we'll have, better, we'll have facilities that are able to provide a higher standard of care to every individual, rather than having a lot of individuals where the standard of care, where, where, where our ability to care for them would be diminished, which can contribute to even more deaths arising. So let's look at testing. Uh, Professor Karim alluded that uh, the NHLS can do about 15,000 tests a day, but it's not um, preferable in South African status. Why is that? Well, I'm not sure Professor Grimm said it's not preferable in South Africa to do 15,000 tests. We have to be doing between 10 and 15,000 tests each day if we are wanting to be able to understand the magnitude of the problem in South Africa if you're wanting to understand who's infected, if you're wanting to put them into isolation to be able to limit the rate of transmission in the community, it's absolutely essential that we need to target testing at least 10 to 15,000, at least 10 to 15,000 each day. If we don't do that, we won't understand where we are in the epidemic. If we don't do that, 
we won't be able to identify the infectious cases who are going to go back in the community and we're not going to be able to contain a rapid spread of the infection in the community. So whatever has happened over the past five weeks in terms of the lockdown can very much diminish into thin air and we basically wouldn't have achieved anything if we don't do that. So testing is absolutely important without any reservation. The World Health Organization and every other scientific community has clearly indicated that to be able to get on top of this epidemic, you need to test and test and test again. Right? So without that, we will fail. Right? And whatever we've tried to do in the past five weeks will come to naught. So that being said, we need to test between 10 and 15,000 per day. Uh, the Department of Health on record is saying that they want to test up to 15 to 30,000 people per day. Hmm. Right? And that is what we need to aspire to. But at the minimum, we probably need to be testing 10 to 15,000 per day for the next two weeks. For this next two week additional part of the lockdown to be of any material benefit, right? We need to be testing at that level. If we're not testing at that level, there's going to be very little that would have been gained with this expanded lockdown period. So let's look at the, the lockdown itself. Is, is it just a blunt tool to stop the spread? And what happens if it's lifted? Does that mean that the virus is going to spread? Yeah, so it becomes a blunt tool, as you put it, uh, if we don't do the other things that are needed to be done during the period of the lockdown. So like I said at the start of the interview, there were three purposes of the lockdown. The first thing is to try to reduce the rate of community transmission, which is likely has happened. The second thing was to, get, to provide some time for facilities, healthcare facilities, to sort of improve their capacity and capabilities to be able to provide care for what's going to be a surge in terms of number of admissions. But the third thing of the lockdown, the reason for the lockdown, was to be able to test at scale, to identify infectious community, the infectious cases in the community, in the houses, right, put them into isolation, so that when the lockdown is lifted, in whatever form or the other, those people don't enter directly into the community and have a huge explosion of community transmission. Right. So in the absence of that, the lockdown will have achieved very little other than actually delay the epidemic for a few weeks. Right. So we have to get the testing part right. We have to identify a large majority of the people that are infectious in the next two weeks, keep them back. They can't go into the community after the lockdown is lifted in whatever form. Right. Even if they're social distancing, those people need to be in isolation until they're no longer infectious. And the same thing goes for their immediate context. They will need to be in quarantine for at least 14 days from the time that infected case is removed from the household or is put into isolation. In the absence of that, unfortunately, the lockdown would have cost the country a huge amount of money, but would have achieved very little. So the individual that's the carrier, asymptomatic, and he's not going for testing, how long will he be a carrier for? Right, so we don't really know right now. So that information hasn't been forthcoming. We know that a mildly symptomatic individual usually carries for up to about 14 days. Right, that's what we know. Uh, so, and that is from the onset of symptoms. Uh, so we're not too sure how long these asymptomatics are going to carry. And I think those studies are underway because, like I said, it's only really over the past few uh, days, literally, that this information is coming to the public light. And hopefully those people are now being followed up yeah. to understand how long they continue sharing. Mm -hmm. My guesstimate would be that they would probably continue sharing the virus, probably again also for about 10 to 14 days, which means okay. that they would be infectious. But I think the important thing of the asymptomatic individuals, they are going to be less infectious than a person that's symptomatic. Hmm. And the person that's mildly symptomatic is likely going to be less infectious than a person that's got severe disease. Because the severity of disease is also linked to the amount of virus the person uh, is sort of uh, colonized with at the, back of the nose, at the back of the throat, as well as in terms of how symptomatic they are with transmitting droplets. So there is a gradient. So it's not that all asymptomatics are going to be as infective as people that are symptomatic or severely ill. They probably will transmit some of the virus, but at a much lower rate than people that are symptomatic. Okay, let's look at the blood test. What other t is, is that a possibility to check whether you are uh, COVID-19 positive and it, is that available here in South Africa? Okay, so there's really two different types of blood tests. It's what we call an antibody type of blood test. A blood test that measures what the immune system has produced to sort of get rid of the virus, and those are called antibodies. And then there's another blood test, which is called an antigen-based test, which is, and it's not just a blood test, it's actually a test that can be done in saliva or any secretions, as an example. Like we do for HIV, you can actually take a saliva sample and test for antibody to HIV. 
Now, the important thing of the antibody blood test is that it doesn't tell us whether someone is infectious. Mm. And in fact, in the early period of infection, in the first 10 to four, to 8 to 10 days, the majority of people that are infected with the virus will have a negative test on the antibody blood test. Okay. Okay? It's only after 10 days or after 8 days that about 80% of people will have a positive test on the blood test. Now, the only use of a blood test is to tell you if someone has been infected in the past. It doesn't tell you if someone has not been infected if you're doing it too early. And what it certainly doesn't tell you is that it doesn't tell you that someone is infectious. It doesn't tell you that the person needs to go into isolation. Right? So that at this point in time, and for the average person, there's absolutely no role, zero role, to do a blood test for the average person. As scientists, we can use it to be able to understand what percentage of our population has been infected when we do serial testing in large percentages of the population. But for everyone else, there's zero role for blood tests against anti for the antibody blood tests. The antigen blood test is something that has uh, been recently licensed by the FDA. Right? It's a very different blood test. It's, an, it's an antigen, not the blood test, it's a saliva test, if I'm not mistaken. It's been licensed by FDA. But even that test has been shown not to have good sensitivity, which means if the test is negative, to be certain the person is not infected, you need to do a proper PCR test. Right? So it's, it's useful if it's positive, it tells you that you've got some of the virus, and the virus might actually be alive in you. But if it's negative, it doesn't tell you you don't have the virus, you still need to do the other PCR. That test is not available in South Africa. It was just recently licensed in the United States. It's probably still only limited to the United States. There are other people that are looking at other antigen uh, tests, uh, usually for saliva samples and nasopharyngeal swab samples, but none of those are commercially available. So anyone that's basically advocating for the use of antibody blood tests to find out if someone is infected or not, that person should not be doing so. And in fact, none of these blood tests are actually registered in South Africa, and it would be illegal to be using any of these blood tests mm. to tell someone whether they're infected or not, for whatever purpose the blood test has been done. So let's talk about the BCG uh, vaccination that we as South Africans have. There's talk around us helping our immune system because of that, and, and we won't get the COVID-19 as bad. Yeah. So look, uh, firstly, uh, the the one analysis that was done to try to, which sort of su suggested or alluded to that VCG might have some protection against COVID, where they looked at countries with uh, few COVID cases and countries with many COVID cases, and they found countries with few COVID cases for countries where VCG was usually used. That analysis is scientifically completely flawed, right, for a number of reasons, which I don't have time to go into. Okay. But there's no basis to that particular type of analysis because it doesn't take into consideration the differences in those countries in terms of where we are in the epidemic. It doesn't take into differences in the consideration a number of other factors, which is too lengthy to go into. So the short answer is that at this stage, there's absolutely no evidence that BCG will protect you against developing COVID illness. In the South African context, where the majority of people that were born since the 1960s actually received BCG when they were children, and the vast majority of people in South Africa, because TB is such a big problem, they have already been infected with TB and the body has mounted an immune response to TB itself. Right? In this particular context, BCG certainly wouldn't be recommended for revaccination under any circumstances. If anything, BCG in the South African context, especially given to adults that are in the older age group, we have probably been previously infected with TB, can result in severe reactions at the site where the vaccine is going to be given. Right? So it would be reckless for anyone in South Africa, in my mind, to consider getting a BCG vaccine in the absence of good scientific evidence that BCG vaccination has got any bearing in terms of protecting against COVID. Professor Shabir Mahdi, in conclusion, you've stated that at the end of the day, if we do not do enough testing in South Africa by the end of lockdown, numbers around 10 to 15,000 a day, this lockdown is not going to be worth our while at all. That's correct. And I think what we need to do as communities is we need to mobilize ourselves within households. If we find a person in our household having more than two of the symptoms which I mentioned, and I'm going to repeat them, cough, fever, sore throat, shortness of breath, difficulty with uh, breathing, which is the same, a chest pain, or even loss of sensation in terms of taste and uh, sort of unable to smell as well as you usually would, two or more of those symptoms 
that person needs to be encouraged to go for testing to the closest place where testing is available. Testing is now freely available in the public sector. Right? There's no reason to need to go to Lancet and pay 1,400 rand or whatever the revised price has been. Right? The testing has become available in the public sector. People need to make use of that opportunity to get tested right? so that we can understand for their own benefit in terms of their own protection, how we can actually get them and also for the protection of their families, importantly. Like I said, if you infected, you're going to infect other people in your household and under the lockdown circumstances, you're even more likely to infect other people in a household compared to the lockdown in Dillon, Texas, because you've got much more contact with people in the household during the lockdown than in the absence of a lockdown. So protect your family, know your status, and help us fight the epidemic by getting tested. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shabir Mahdi, uh, Professor of Vaccinology, for your time and your expertise. All the best till we chat again. Assalamu alaikum. Remember, you can interact with us with any of the questions and statements and facts that uh, was shown and talked about today via our WhatsApp line. Please do keep connected with Health Matters COVID-19 Extra. For myself, Hawa Salomon, wassalamu alaikum and goodbye for now.